Executive Director of the Royal Marine Corps, and today we want to do. I know some people have been working with Dr. Dunbar, and the idea of doing this presentation is to have the community of West End learn more about the work that he has been doing for so many, so many years. All her, all his um, studies, protocols, and the result that he have did, that he has gotten from this uh, study. So, and how can we use it here? Uh, as co-managers of the Bayonne National Marine Park, how can this information be useful for the management of this area of actions that we need to, to do? And I think it's going to be very interesting. It's interesting we're taping recording, so maybe we get some of the co-managers to join and watch the video uh, later on so we can learn more about turtles and the turtles here in Roatan, that we just see them and enjoy them, but we need to learn more about how to conserve them, how to keep them, what do we need to do to I think uh, Dr. Dunbar's uh, studies is going to help us do that. So, thank you so much and welcome to the Rotary Park. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually going to stand this way. Can I turn it this way a little bit so they see me? Uh, that way I can advance. Uh, so, my name is Dr. Steve Dunbar. I am a professor of biology at Melinda University in California. I'm also the director. Group, which is our research group at Loma Linda Woods, and the founder and president of the Protective Turtle Ecology Center for Training Outreach and Research, Inc. It's a 501c3, but we call it, it press the name, Protector Inc. So I was the Protector Inc. Uh, and uh, currently, as well, I am the president of the International Center. And uh, that's a one-year appointment. So I have the task of arranging the Global International Sea Turtle Symposium for 2024, which I'm organizing for Thailand, in Thailand. So, uh, the world sea turtle researchers and students and people working on conservation will be joining us at that international symposium in so today, I want to talk a little bit, this is just a, um, a few puzzle pieces of some of the research that we've been doing here uh, in Roatan. I've been working in Roatan and the Bay Islands since 2006, so 17 years I've been working here on sea turtles. A little bit before that, working on manatees over in Florida Salado, wildlife refuge. And before that, doing some contracts for USAID here around Roatan, surveys for lobster. So uh, I have a fair bit of experience with doing research here in Honduras, not only in the Bay Islands, but on the North Coast, as well as on the Pacific Coast of the country, where we worked uh, for about seven years on all of Ridley. They have them there as well? They do. So that's the main uh, <coughs> there, although we have a few uh, Eastern Pacific oxbills, as well as a few Eastern Pacific leatherbacks. Algiers actually has five. Uh, does anybody know how many species of sea turtles there are altogether? Seven. There are seven, only seven species around the world, and Algiers has five of the seven. The only two that it doesn't have is the Kemp's Ridley that only occurs in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, Kemp's Ridley, which is the 
And the um, flat back is the tater depressus. Uh, only occurs around Australia. So it's no surprise that we don't have it here. But the other five species we have somewhere in the waters of Honduras, four of them on the Caribbean side, and three of them on the Pacific. Uh, so we're going to talk, uh, and those five species, by the way, are the green turtle, Colonia Midas, the hawksbill turtle, which you see here, these two you see here. The uh, olive ridley over on the Pacific, which is Lepida Kelly's Olivacea. Uh, the loggerhead turtle, which we get here occasionally, but not very often, is Coretta Coretta. And the, uh, which one am I missing? And the leatherback, Dermal Kelly's Coretta. So those occur. Uh, Almost all of them on both coasts, except for all the Ridley's that don't occur in the Caribbean. So today I'm going to take you through some of our research that we've been doing here in the Marine Reserve, uh, the Sandy Bay West End Marine Reserve, which covers about 13 kilometers or so of the, the coast, mostly up this kind of uh, western to northern side, a little bit around the tip uh, of the island. Uh, but mostly that area, and we've been studying that area, turtles in that area since 2015. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about, um, first of all, on advancing. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're going to talk about the impacts, uh, potential impacts of nesting beach loss on the Sandy Bay West End Marine Reserve, reserve here. Okay, so some people might say, well, what does the nesting beach have to do with the reserve here? And when I first started to come to the West End to start doing research here, many, many people, including most of the live operators, were very much against us doing the kind of research that we do. They thought that once we took the turtles out of the water, took a blood sample, tagged them, that it was going to scare them, and they were going to leave the marine reserve. Uh, we know that that would not happen. I knew that from a long time ago from other research around the world, but also our research from up the east end of the island up at Oak Ridge. We were tagging turtles, taking blood samples, releasing them, and then getting them back again within months or less. So um, there was kind of an outcry about us doing this research, uh, many people against us, many people kind of, you know, saying that we should be doing this. Someone uh, decided to write to our senator in California <coughs> the university because they thought I was going to destroy the economy of this third world country, that their words, not mine, uh, by, you know, doing this research on CG. Uh, but it was very much a position of ignorance, right? And ignorance is, of course, the worst position you can hold. Sometimes you feel like it's the best position. So what we've been doing is uh, doing this work to, to not only see what's happening within the marine reserve, but also see how the marine reserve may be connected to other locations in the life cycle of sea turtles. So I want to, and this is part of a splash of head talk where we've been working uh, for several years now. Uh, Splashing has been very, very kind in hosting our research work there. And so we attract people to that, that uh, particular resort uh, because we are doing the work. So just a little overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit just for a second about Protector, the work that we've been doing. An overview of sea turtle life cycles. Sorry for standing in the way. I usually carry my own. <laughs> we'll talk about nesting beach background in the Bay Islands and some of our work uh, throughout all the Bay Islands looking for nesting beach. And then we'll talk a little bit about the recent history of <coughs> nesting beach changes on Utila and why that's important. And then the potential impacts on juveniles within the marine reserve here. So, first of all, just a little bit about uh, our work, Protector Inc.'s work. Um, 
when we started this work in 2006 in Honduras, there were no publication journals in the country, uh, except for two, one from 1987, one from about 1992. Uh, both, um, one was by Car um, uh, what's his name at Luna? Gustavo. Gustavo Cruz, who went around the markets to look for turtle meat, did a kind of an assessment of that. And the other was by uh, a current colleague who essentially was on Caius Cuccino's set of islands called Mainland uh, and released some hatchlings and followed them out for about 20 minutes to see the capital. That was the only information about seafood in the country. Since our work here, uh, we have continued each year to provide reports to the government of Honduras. Um, we've been funded several times by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and, of course, report to them. And then, of course, we've had several <coughs> graduate students who have worked here. And so there are many uh, scientific journal publications that we have uh, produced on our work here, as well as things like uh, report called Too Rare to Wear uh, on the Hawksbill shell trade around Central and South America. We contributed to that for the uh, country of Honduras. And then uh, this is a photograph I took within the marine reserve of a, some, some people ask, how do you tell a male from a female? This is how. This big long male back end is a sign that that is now a a sub-adult or adult male. Females don't have those long tails. Not their penis. It's the, penis the penis is in the tail. I see. The penis is inside. So when they mount the female, they bring this around and, and it's the penis is in the <coughs> Okay? But the, the tail houses. Obviously, they don't want it sitting out exposed. Um, so this Lots and lots of uh, we contributed chapters to sea turtle research and conservation this back in I think 2020 or so. Um, all of these reports, publications you can find on our website at turtleprotector.org. Uh, we're also part of the wider Caribbean sea turtle network. There was a page set up for Honduras many years ago before we started, and it just had those two publications by myself. Carlos husband. Um, now, when you go in there, there are dozens and dozens of uh, publications that are part of the wider Caribbean. You find the publications there, all the, lots of pictures of our work. So, that's just a little introduction. I want to now talk a little bit about uh, oxbill life cycles. And I'm going to be specific about oxbills because the other turtle species are a little bit different in some of their life cycle aspects. We're going to start the life cycle where everything begins, and that's at the nesting beach. And the little turtles hatch out of the eggs, come out of the nest, erupt out of the nest. Uh, we say they boil out of the nest because they just climb over each other, come out. And uh, from there, they go uh, wherever the nest is, down the beach. They crawl down the beach, and they get into the water. Uh, that crawling on the beach is a very important part of their initial stage because they are then imprinting on the magnetic fields of that particular beach. So then they go out as little ones, uh, little hatchlings, and then grow for about a year and a half to two years, uh, simply floating around on algal mats. Uh, a lot of the algal mats that they float around on are sargassum, which you see out here. Sometimes if you're here at the right time of the year, you'll see tons of sargassum washing up on, piling up on shore, and rotting and kind of sinking almost the whole island, right? Um, but these guys can often be found in all these little algal mats, rafting around sometimes hundreds to thousands of miles over a year or two. Uh, this is what's called the neuritic phase uh, because they are just at sea. The next stage is that they sometimes then will graft into an area where there are coral reefs, and from the algal mat, which they have been kind of just 
eating whatever they can find. They learn to swim, dive down, and come back up to the mat, ride it some more, and dive down, and they grab little crabs, little fish, whatever they can find. And then they'll come across a reef area. And again, this is specific to hawk schools. They come across a reef area, and they will leave that pelagic state and go into the, did I, did I call some names? Did I say neuritic? No, no, sorry, sorry. This is pelagic. This is the neuritic phase, okay? So they, they leave the pelagic phase and then recruit into this coral reef area. They're going to then settle in here for the next eight, 10, 12 years. And they'll be there when you go out day or night, they're gonna be in that area for the next eight, 10, 12 years. Not going anywhere. And if you are to capture, of course, this is the stuff that we know, but they did, but not. They did not. And even though we held meetings, a lot of people didn't bother to come and even learn these things. But in any case, uh, even if you take this turtle and you take it up to the east end of the island of the Kent Bay, you release it up there, uh, assuming it makes it through Punta Gorda or Helene, or those, those communities where they captured through, it will be back down here in its home range within a day. Uh, they, so they, take your capture them over there they do. There. there are still communities around the island that capture people. Yeah. Of course. But they capture them. Okay? So um, they are very, very ingrained once they settle into that Britic phase and they have their home range. Uh, it's just like you and me. We have a home range where we live. Right? We know where the grocery store is, we know where the school is, we know where our work is, and we just stay there. And if you go to the doctor and he point, pokes you with a needle, you're going to say, oh, I'm moving out of here, I'm leaving. Right? I'm going to pack up and leave because that doctor poked me. Probably not, right? That's a pretty expensive doctor's visit if you're going to move because someone poked you. Right? And it's the same with these guys. The fact that we take them out and we take a blood sample with them, does not deter them from going right back to their known home range. And we know that their home ranges within the marine reserve are less than a square kilometer. But when you go out, you keep seeing the same turtle around the same, the same uh, dive sites over and over and over. Because they're not leaving that area until they're ready. Not because we captured them or took blood samples or put a flipper tag on them, that's not going to make them leave. They'll leave only when they're ready to leave. We'll talk about that. That's the next phase. That's when they become adults. Almost all of the turtles within the marine reserve are all juveniles during this period. They become adults. They typically leave the neuritic area where the juveniles are. And this makes good sense because you don't want big adults taking up all the food of the juveniles. That's not a very smart system. You eat all the juveniles out, and all their genes disappear. Okay, and so it's very important that the adults then leave that area uh, and leave the food to these rapidly growing juveniles. Another thing is to know that once they hit adulthood, their growth essentially plateaus, asymptotes. So that they're only growing maybe a millimeter or so a year. But when they're juveniles, they're growing very rapidly, sometimes 15 or 20 centimeters in a year, and putting on four, five, or eight kilos, that's 16 or 17 pounds in a year. They're growing very, very rapidly. And then they slow down. Then the next stage is that they will go back to the mating form, the female go back to the area where potentially she was hatched and the males will go to these mating grounds in several locations. They're not choosy, they'll just go back, they'll mate with several females, different ones, and they'll leave that area and go to another mating ground if it's nearby and mate with a bunch of females there. But the females are very, very uh, faithful of fidelity to their nesting site. So every two years for hospitals, they'll come back to the same place as long as the place is there. 
If it's been removed and destroyed, then they'll start looking elsewhere. So once they mate, <clears throat> mating is a very, very aggressive process. So people, again, think when we are tagging turtles or taking blood at the nesting beaches, they think that we're hurting the turtles, and then the turtles are not going to come back and lay. When you see the mate, you know that having a little uh, needle prick is nothing to them. Mating is very, very aggressive with the males, hanging on to the females sometimes for days, biting the female, then the other males will come and try to bite the first male and mount the first male with the female underneath. We've seen pictures of them stacked up with three males on a female, and she's still got to get to the surface with all three of them to breathe. This is a very aggressive process. So again, this is facts that many people don't know when they're saying, well, you're just hurting the turtles. You're torturing the turtles. No, we're not torturing them. If anything, it's torture. It's this. The mating process. Then those females will come up to nest on the sand. They'll come up uh, two to three to four times, two to four times within a nesting season. And every time they will nest, uh, they will put about 140 to 160 eggs in each nest. So doing that three or four times, you calculate that, we're talking about four to five, almost 600 nest eggs in a season. Uh, and then she will leave that those eggs there incubate for Hawksville about 63 days, depending on the weather conditions. And then of course they'll hatch up. There's no parental care. She doesn't hang around and wait for them to hatch and then leave them somewhere. Uh, she's not going up on the beach like many people say, crying because she's not going to see her babies. Um, turtles don't cry. Right? They do exude salt. In salt lands, and so many people will see this whitish material uh, in their eyes, but it's salt, not crying. Okay, so uh, we don't need to kind of apply these anthropomorphisms, these kind of human characteristics to turtles. They're reptiles, along with snakes and lizards and crocodiles. How many people say crocodiles cry when they go and have to lay you know, their eggs because they're going to leave their babies? Nobody talks about. That. All right, so this is the life cycle, and we're going to focus uh, on these, these two aspects as well as uh, the hatchlings and um, the neuritic phase. Okay, so a few uh, points here. This is a nesting oxbill. Uh, you'll see her right uh, here, but you will see her dropping eggs. That uh, dropping the eggs from here. Um, that, that's all right. Yeah. There you go. You can see the eggs dropping here. Just the cloaca. Uh, once she's finished nesting, she will cover that up, and the eggs are on their own. Uh, if there's predators around that dig up the nest, they will dig up and eat the eggs. Cats, dogs, uh, mongooses, feral pigs. A huge problem about uh, their pan tropical range. Fox goes everywhere in the tropical All right. So um, then the hatchlings come out, which look like this. These are hawksbill hatchlings. They tend to be kind of grayish looking um, and then grow from there again into the neuritic phase. Here is a video within the marine reserve of a juvenile video that years ago, and you'll see that this turtle is fairly plump in size, but still a juvenile. So people think when they see the turtles down there, they often report, man, I saw this huge turtle, he was about this big. Well, that's not really huge, they're still a juvenile. When these are adults, they're about 85 to 90 centimeters just in the shell. And most of the ones we're getting here are about 40 to 60 centimeters. So they're still well under adult size. Um, I don't know that I would try tackling an adult. Yeah, go ahead. 
Will they bite? Will they try to bite? They won't try to bite you uh, unless, of course, you stick your hand in front of them. But even when I capture them and bring them to the surface, their only interest is to make sure that they can get air, right? Because they have to breathe, not fish. So I often get asked, how long can they stay out of the water? They can stay out for months, right? As long as you keep them cool enough and they don't overheat. Uh, the old explorers used to bring them from Ascension Island uh, in the middle of the Atlantic over to Brazil and all over the Caribbean by just flipping them on their back and keeping them on the ship. They just throw some water on them once in a while just to keep them cool down, but they would then use them for fresh meat over the months that they were sent. How long can they stay on the water? Well, uh, that's a good question. It can depend on the size. The bigger they are, the longer they can stay down. These little juveniles, if they're just resting, can be down for about 25 minutes to half an hour for just sleeping. 25 minutes to half an hour? Yes, on so a single breath. How do they sleep then? How what? How do they sleep? Uh, they, they go to sleep. I mean, they actually close their eyes and they sleep. But I mean at night. Yep. One breath will last for 25 half an hour, minutes, half an hour. Correct. Then they'll sleep for that 25 minutes and then back up to the surface, back down. If they are through the day, like when we see them out diving, typically they're on the move, they're feeding. So that breath will usually only last them about 12 to 13 minutes. They have to go up, get a breath, come back down, and cruise around. So we're very, very careful when we're capturing them to make sure that we're getting them to the surface, watching them all the time to make sure they're not breathing out. They breathe out while we're still underwater, <coughs> they can drown. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure we get them. Okay, uh, a little history here. 2006, we began a search throughout Roatan for nesting beaches. We only had occasional, we only had reports of occasional nesting throughout the island. Uh, very, very low numbers. One here, one there, five years ago, one was over here. Uh, eight years ago, two nested over there, but for the island of Roatan, uh, was very, very little nesting. In 2007, we hired an ultralight plane. In 2007 and 2008, we hired an ultralight plane and essentially flew around the whole island of Roatan in the summer looking for aggregation of turtles, these nesting and feeding uh, turtles. Couldn't find any, couldn't find any tracks on the nesting. Uh, so um, in 2008 uh, to 10, we continued to survey beaches and talk to local fishermen. So I've walked every beach on the side, personally. I've walked every beach on the side, from down here all the way to the um, And there's, we came to the conclusion there's no regular nesting, there's occasional nesting, but there's no nesting population. So here's a little ultralight that we hired. We fly at about 500 feet or so, and then be looking all along these beaches for signs of nesting, or signs of groups of turtles in the water. 2010, I had a call from Vika Utila, Vika is the Bay Islands Conservation Association, uh, to come over. They had some nesting occurring, but uh, it was very small, about five <clears throat> nests a year. So they uh, asked if I would come over and help to set up a monitoring system over there. So in 2011, we went over and received some funds from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, started monitoring, took a graduate student over there, and that graduate student, uh, Lindsay DiMazzo, in 2012, part of her project was to survey the one regular nesting beach that was on pumpkin, that was on utility called Pumpkin Hill uh, Beach. So she was surveying for slope and vegetation because it appeared that most of the nesting was happening in one area of this one kilometer beach. Yes, does this, this happen at a certain time of year? It happens now in the summer, from about uh, May, late April to early May, all the way through to about the end of September to early October. And of course, you've got two months of hatching after that, right? Months of incubation. Um, so this was uh, Lindsay doing survey for slow vegetation <coughs> over there. Notice all the thick vegetation over on Pumpkin Hill in Utila. Um, and this is from within the vegetation, looking out to sea. 
Uh, and one of the maps that we produced from her data was on vegetation. And you'll notice all this light green color is very low lying vegetation, and this darker green color is kind of this high bush and then palm trees, a larger tree. And notice where the larger trees are. Larger trees and all that bush are what make the area dark. That's what sea turtles like, and in fact, that was the area where the majority of sea turtle nesting was happening, right in that little area. Um, here she is surveying for slope, and we produced this slope map from 0 centimeters to about 400 centimeters. And you'll notice again here to the east, it's quite shallow, but as you get to the west, you have higher elevation in the beach. Again, this is the same area where the turtles were mostly nesting. Okay? So there's one thing about hawksbills, they like when they come to the nest, they like to be up high on the beach. In all of that thick vegetation, it seems uh, counterintuitive, but they love to dig through all that viney vegetation that you see on the beaches and then put their nests there. Okay? That's critical for them. Um, so in 2011, we had about five nests. Between 2011 and 2015, that number went up to over 50 nests because we were on the beach monitoring night after night. We actually would go to the beach at about 5 6 o'clock in the evening and stay there walking the beach about every 45 minutes until about 4 o'clock. Right? Every night we would do that through the summer. Uh, and Bika would also come out and help. Uh, do that monitoring as well. 2016 dropped way down to about 10 nests, and then in 2017, five nests. Uh, anybody remember what happened in 2016? You probably don't. It was an ENSO event. That was an El Nino Southern Oscillation event. So the water became very warm, and we think that current flows uh, changed so much so that the turtles actually couldn't find their way to the nesting beaches. This was not just here, this was a phenomenon around the Caribbean. That regular nesting beaches just dropped off, and places where they had no regular nesting all of a sudden increased. So uh, what's important to notice here is this increasing trend uh, of nesting. Okay. <clears throat> now Bika can monitor on that beach and they reported to us that the monitors were starting to find BBQ and YYJ tags. If you've taken pictures of the turtles out here, you know that they are tagged with BBQ and YYJ tags. It has a three letter, three number uh, kind of configuration. And those are unique, right? Everyone is different, YYJ and then a combination of three or BBQ. I don't choose the the, uh, the letters that's just randomly gem generated. Lots of people have asked me about these BBQ uh, eggs for turtles. No, we don't want to barbecue them. Uh, <laughs> it's just the random, the random tag that they, uh, that they generate. So what was interesting was that they were starting to see nesters in Utila that they had not put tags on. They had no record of these particular monitors, right? So all of a sudden, the wheels are turning in my head, saying, what's happening here? Uh, so we'll look at this a little bit. Uh, there's evidence that turtles that we've tagged here in the marine reserve are actually, like, I, like we followed the life cycle, are maturing, leaving the marine reserve and going somewhere we don't know where. But then, if this scenario is actually true, that they're seeing these BB2 and YYG tags, then it means that those mature females are going to Utila to nest. Okay? That makes sense to you? Yeah. All right. Uh, so this is really good news for us that we would not have any of this information if we were not tagging the turtles here in the marine reserve. How would they know that those turtles were tagged here if we never put tag on, tags on them? How would they know that they were from here? They would never have that information, right? So the fact that we actually were putting the tags on in the marine reserve 
is what then allows us to recognize these turtles actually nesting. Uh, quick question. Oh, what happened? Yeah. Yes, yes. How long the adults? How long can they live? How hours? Um, can you, sorry, can you turn me back? I think they hit. Uh, how long can the adults? Adults can hold the bread for uh, pretty close to about an hour. Hour to a little more than that. Um, some studies have suggested that they can, um, wherever you pick up all of them, they can down to it's up. Oh, it went. Um, some studies on the physiology of turtles suggest that turtles can slow their heart rates down to about one beat every nine minutes. So that's pretty impressive. Yep. Oh. Right. Right. They could, could they break enough and be underwater for six hours? No. No way. No. Okay. Um. All right. So, um, so we have this information because we can tell. Okay. So the distance from the marine reserve to uh, Pumpkin Hill Beach is about 35 kilometers. That's uh, basically an afternoon swim. Few hours, they'll be across that 35 kilometers. Uh, and remember what we said that if these turtles are maturing and leaving the marine reserve, they're going out there somewhere, uh, which we don't know where exactly that is. But if they are hanging out there and then coming back to nest at Pumpkin Hill, then the little hatchlings that come from there may actually be entrained in these local eddies for that, those lost years of a year and a half to two years, just hanging around here, there, kind of swimming around until they hit their neuritic phase, and they happen to be around here during that, that recruitment stage. So then they may be recruiting into the marine reserve, okay? So, as of 2018, so here's the bad news, all of Pumpkin Hill Beach was sold off for private uh, land law, house law, okay? Uh, so that's an issue. So here's a couple of pictures of what it looked like in 2012 when my graduate student was working there doing the survey. Uh, and you can see some of the difference in beach erosion and law between 2012 and 2000. Lots of erosion going on. Uh, we see as well these kind of wider, not terribly wide, but wide, ice, ice slope beaches. And look at the vegetation that's here. Again, remember, that's where the hawks was going to nest, where it's dark, lots of stuff on the ground. 2019, this is what it looks like. A lot of the vegetation dying off, and again, a lot of beach erosion. Uh, for them, this, this was for a long time the only regular nesting population we knew of in all of the Bay Island. Nowhere else. Okay. And then this is what it looked like. Uh, Lindsay would report to me that she'd get a turtle that would come into all this vegetation, then they'd lose it. They could hear the turtle rustling around, they could never find it. That's how dense the vegetation was. So this is looking from within the vegetation out to the out to sea. This is what it looked like in 2019. Right, three houses built there, and the owners decided to go to Vika, the Bay Islands Conservation Association, and suggested them that they should take out all of the vegetation down here because it would help the hatchlings get out of the nest easier. And Vika, not knowing anything about turtles, and rather than phoning or sending an email to me to say, hey, what do you think? They just decided, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do it. We'll help the turtles by taking all the vegetation. So <laughs> the problem now is that we lost all the vegetation here, and now we're in houses that we don't know how to fight it. 
that attracts the hatchlings away from the ocean. Well, this is a problem. So some potential impacts. Remember, there are three major changes to the Dillon nesting beach that we have noticed. One is beach erosion. I haven't been over there in the last couple of years, but I understand it's still eroding. And I think they're still building houses. I don't know. Have you been over there again? No. I don't know I if they see that they have so uh, they, lots on the Yes, I, I came from there yeah. two months ago. Yeah. I think they reported like the 77 nests last year. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. That's not bad, is it? No, no, I mean, it, it's, it's increasing. Good. It's increasing. But remember, uh, and I'll show you, I'll show you uh, the scenario here in just a uh, Beach erosion, beach development, and of course, then the loss of nesting beach. If you continue to build houses and get rid of the vegetation, that can be a problem. So, um, if the new recruits are coming from Utila, um, this could be a major influx of recruits to the green reserve that all of a sudden we may lose if nesting stops happening on that beach. Remember my graphic life cycle and those turtles will be now. Nesting in 2019 actually was down about 50%. I don't know again if it's bounced back, but I haven't been receiving data from Vika. They reported they had a record, like the highest they've ever had. Yeah. I don't know why it was that. That would be, that would be great. Yeah, I just know that they reported that to us. It would be nice yeah, if we still, could yeah. actually see some data. Yeah. But um, <laughs> if nesting continues to drop due to the three factors we talked about, then we may see the following happen. Okay, and this is only a scenario. I can't guarantee this is going to happen, but there are ways to test to see if it will. One is that the maturing individuals in the marine reserve are still going to leave, right? That's just part of the natural life cycle. They're going to leave the marine reserve. That's one. Two, hatchling production from Utila may start to slow down. And if they continue to build and sell off the property, it may eventually cease. There might be a gradual drop in recruits into the marine reserve. What is the S D again? I'm sorry. This is the Sandy Bay West End Marine. This, that's the Marine Reserve here, right? The Marine. And then total numbers of turtles in the Marine Reserves may drastically be reduced or disappear eventually. All right. So I have I have some kind of uh, predictions, uh, but how can we know if this is a real scenario? Well, we need to haplotype the genetic finger, individual fingerprint of each turtle. We need to haplotype all of the individuals within the genus. One. But we also need to haplotype the nesting females in utility. Because the haplotype that we're looking at is mitochondrial DNA. That is the DNA that's coming from the mother of all siblings. That way we can make a direct line of a relationship. And we need to know the haplotypes of the hatchlings from utility. So <clears throat> we've actually collected some dead hatchlings. We've got blood samples from some nesting uh, mothers over there, which we have at Loma Linda that we're in the process of uh, analyzing. So this is some work done by uh, one of my recent uh, 2020 she graduated. Um, this is a little bit complicated, but it is with haplotypes. Haplotypes are given a kind of a code. This code is E I A zero one E I a02 EI stands for Repellis Imbrica. That's the scientific name for the Hawks. And we had a sample from the Marine Reserve of 30, uh, 35 individuals. So what this what this little uh, table is showing you is the relationship of other countries within the Caribbean to our turtles. So when we look at the fingerprint of our turtles, what we find out is that some of them. Ten of them uh, have come from um, the several other countries. These other countries have the same haplotypes that ten of our 30 into 35 individuals have. Okay, so what that means is there's individuals here that most likely the mothers are living through the year in these other countries, like uh, what's this, Delta Bay, Antigua, um, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba. 
uh, Mexico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and so forth. Puerto Rico. What? That they were going from here to the U.S. Virgin Islands? Uh, that they are living in the U.S. Virgin Islands and probably coming here to nest, and then the eggs hatch out, and then they recruit into the marine reserve. Because these are blood samples from these hatched, these uh, juveniles. So these swim up the Caribbean? Absolutely. Absolutely. We know that by satellite telemetry, and we put satellite tags on nesting turtles in Utila. Found that some of them went to Belize and up to Cozumel, near Cozumel. So others are coming from other places as well. Tiga, you wish for a Where? Okay. So, um, and you'll see that we have some of our, our individuals are all on the bottom here. So we have two individuals, for instance, here that have the same haplotype as these guys from it. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're coming from there, but it may mean that they have the same mother. Wherever she is nesting, that's the idea. So what's important about this data is, if you look at across ours, we have three, four, what are called orphan haplotypes. What this means is that so far, we can't find in all the public databases of haplotypes of hospitals a match for these four individuals. Right? So, so these are not coming from these other countries. So where might they be coming from? Right? We don't know that. But they may be coming from Utila because nobody else would have the haplotypes for Utila except us. We haven't done the haplotypes yet for those adults and hatching. Right? So they're orphan haplotypes. What that means is you've got over, remember we're talking about 35 individuals, and four of them are orphan haplotypes. That's over 15%. That's a pretty large number of individuals that that percent holds over the population of individuals that may be recruiting from the You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So this is pretty important data. So my predictions are this. One, we may see reduction or complete loss of nesting on Utila, nesting beach within the next two, four, six, seven years. We can't really know because it's going to take, how, how, many, how many times did they nest? Once every two years. So it's gonna take some time before the population recognizes, hey, the beach is disappearing. It's not gonna to be tomorrow. It's going to take a few years, right? And as those individuals are still nesting, there's going to be still hatchlings that are recruiting into the marine reserve. But if the numbers of adult nesting there starts dropping, that means the number of eggs produced and hatchlings produced is also going to start dropping. Is there 15% of the population recruiting into the marine reserve? And those start disappearing. Again, that's going to be several years because how many years are they rafting around? At least a year and a half to two years. So you can see that this is kind of a delayed process because of the life cycle. So this is why people think, oh, we can do anything. And there's still lots of turtles, lots of turtles, until all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. And that's because of the delayed time. <laughs> We may see a corresponding reduction in recruitment to young turtles coming into the marine reserve within the next four, notice how this is a little longer, four to six, seven years, we don't know, okay? But that's a possibility. And then we may see near complete loss of turtles again, because there were, when I first started coming here, even people who were diving out here said, we didn't see turtles out here, even in the reserve. So this is a recent phenomenon over the last like, 10 years that they've kind of increased within the marine. So there's potential that we could see that loss of turtles again, six, nine, ten years in the future. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, so what can we do? Well, we can continue to support real sea turtles. 
just going out and looking at the turtles and saying, oh, they're fine, everybody's healthy, everything's okay, we see the turtles all the time, that's not research. That's not gonna tell you anything about the population. All right, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, that's not gonna tell you anything about the population. You have to get those individuals, get them tagged, get them identified, take blood samples, understand their haplotypes, their genetics, uh, and do the kind of research that we're doing, right? The government, local and central governments need to invest in protected areas. Uh, we told the government about Pumpkin Hill in 2016, 17, at a big meeting with ICF and the government, DFS, and all of those guys over in Texas, and said, you need to buy this property, the land for sale, you need to spend the money and buy this property. Of course, they had no, no interest in, in sea turtles at that time. But can they set up regulations, you know, that you feel the beach front, the beach front is public? Because yes, you can. Regulations about that catching. Abs absolutely, you can set them up. But yeah. part of the problem is, as you well know, there are lots of legal rules, uh, but often enforcement is the, the, the limiting factor because you can't get people on every beach to say, so that's part of the issue. But really, the only way to protect the beach is to buy it. Is to buy it. And the government is the one that needs to invest in buying some of these protected areas or, or areas and setting them up as protected zones. This is a hard one. This is a hard one because it's easy to say and very difficult to do. Reducing the sale of all kinds of important properties uh, to kind of take a Bit of a lot economically for the short term, but a long term. And that's hard. That's a hard sell for places like this where um, where it is uh, pretty difficult to live. Um, I just want to give a shout out to my uh, 2019 2019 um, interns, my 2022 interns, right here, and I've got 2023 interns here in the back. Uh, which their, their pictures will get posted on there later. Um, these are just some of the organizations and people that have helped them along the way. And so um, that's essentially the end of my talk. Uh, my, my hope is that people can start to see that there are real connections, potentially real connections between areas. It's not, it's not uh, appropriate for the managers of the marine reserve to say we don't care what happens over there or what happens on the east side of the island or what happens in the island because they're connected right they definitely are connected and we've seen turtles that we released up in Barbarette in 2015 and in 2017 my graduate students who were here saw a turtle with a tag on its right rear flipper with a big long tail. What does that tell you? It's a male. But it was released two years earlier and born two years and hatched two years before that. So within six years, this turtle is becoming an adult. But we wouldn't know that except that we have the data from when the turtles were hatched from the island of Barbarette. And then seeing that turtle in the museum. So it tells you those places are connected. You can't just say, well, this is our reserve. We don't care what happens elsewhere. That's not viable. That will never work, All right? So it's got to be that the co-managers of the marine reserve think about and work with these <coughs> other areas to make sure they're all connected. Well, I hope that's the message that kind of gets me. All right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> If, if we have time, we can take a few questions. Okay. Bonnie, sorry, thank you. I'm just curious uh, about, well, I don't know, mm -hmm. for turtles. Yes. For some of the clusters. What, um, what are the penalties for this? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, when we first started on that utility beach, uh, Pumpkin Hill Beach in 2010 and 11. What Vika was reporting to us was that they were seeing lots of poaching. 
they were seeing lots of, we call it direct cave. So people, fishermen coming at night, knowing the turtles were coming up, they would get the turtle, kill it, take the eggs, take the meat. Sometimes they would be selling the meat the next day, uh, and then the people would be reporting that there was a shell there. The police would go looking for the meat, and sometimes they would find the people, you know, put them in jail for a couple of nights, then poof, they're out. And then they're back the next week doing the same thing. So one of the reasons that beach monitoring actually works is the fishermen know that it's illegal. And you can go to any of these communities, they know it's illegal. But they'll tell you right away, yeah, we killed three turtles last week. Got a big turtle feed, you know, and all these kinds of stuff. Uh, because there is no real penalty. There's very little enforcement. And even though we have an ICF office here at Rota, right, they don't go to Hanin or to Punta, Punta Gorda to say to those people, you must stop killing these turtles, right, and working with them for some kind of alternative. I started, when I first started here in 2006, that's who I worked with, Punta Gorda, Hanin, all those fishermen up there. And we had the idea of building a craft market up on the East End in Punta Gorda. But I could never get the government, I could never get anybody to kind of provide the funding to make something like that. Nowadays, it's probably easy. At that time, nobody was interested. So that became a problem. Is it public fish? Or would actually pay these people that are Taking the turtles, say, if you bring the turtles to us, you know, the same amount that and, right. and that would be right. And that's that's essentially what we did through the reef house we did up there in Oak Ridge. We we set up kind of business with the fishermen to say, don't kill them, but bring them to us and we'll give you ten dollars. And that worked very well for several years that I did the research. Until the resort fell on hard times and couldn't pay the fishermen. So anyway, you do. So it has to be it has to be more than just about paying people to save the turtles. It's got to be a mindset, and the people have to recognize that the turtles are worth more alive. You can attract five tourists up there to go out with you on your boat to see turtles and charge them each one. 20 bucks, $35. That's five times what you're going to get from selling that meat. And you could keep doing it. Once you sold the meat, that's it. You're not going to get anything more from that turtle than the 10 or $15 you get from the meat. Right? But to use it as a source for tourism, which is what the Marine Park is doing. Look how much money the Marine Reserve is generating by attracting people to see turtles, to see sharks, and to see what's out here. And that's the mentality that people have to kind of adopt. But that, again, is a hard sell when you're talking to fishermen and you say, I gotta feed my family. Well, feed them chickens, right? <laughs> chickens don't cost you that much. You can have lots of chickens and eggs, and that doesn't cost you as much as the fuel to go out and chase them. So eat the chicken. But don't eat the turtles. Take the turtles. Did they get them when they're nesting? Yes, absolutely. They don't have to go around that. Absolutely. So there are different, I mean, there are different scenarios. But again, governments have to put in the funds to be able to get this stuff going, to generate. Um, I can't take my personal, you know, funds from my bank and say, okay, I'll build a craft got to be, it's, it's their country, not my country. I'm just here to help. They've got to be the ones who say, yeah, we see the value of this. And up until last year, with the new government, no ever, no government over our 17, 18 years working here has ever seen the value of these turtles. They don't care anything about what they do. But this new government has really seen the benefit like many of you know, came out to visit us the Secretary of State and spend some time with you. So that's a huge difference. And we're now seeing the 
benefits of that understanding of all. And not to argue that you justify the government, but uh, whenever we'll just, before you, you just have only one person, right? Or the whole three actions. Yeah. And it's the same way with the judges. Yes. And so process for the third government, process that you department all uh, infractions. Infraction is yeah. not occurring. Yeah. For them, it's just uh, drug dealing, and right. violence. Or, we have other so like way ball. down, way down, yeah, turtles, like, you know, <laughs> they're way at the bottom. But with this new government, they have, they have started putting funds into environment, to healthcare, education, which no other government in the 20 years I've been working for has ever done. None of it. So this is a different, as far as, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and then you were saying about the Sandy Bay Marine uh, protected area, Western Marine area. Mm -hmm. This is before in 2005 or 2010. The only protected area was the Sandy Bay West End. So, yes. right now, the protected area is supposed to be the whole area. Yeah, right. But again, the issue is that you'll see when you go out diving, you see the Marine Park's boats going out and patrolling with. These guys in fatigues, police, and the military. And that's what's required. But the other places, despite the fact that all three Bay Islands are marine reserve, marine park essentially, you don't have that happening uh, in reality, right? It's what we call a paper park. It's on paper, but the enforcement and monitoring, the daily monitoring is not there. Uh, even here, I mean, uh, last, I think it was last year, someone came into the marine reserve, into the marine reserve here, into the marine reserve, captured a green turtle, butchered it just outside the marine reserve, and then was selling it, uh, kind of open, right? And that's in a monitor protected area. So imagine what they're doing outside, where it's not being monitored. So this is hard work. This is this is the work of the angel. White cast director. Any other questions? I remember in another presentation you talked about the feeding habits. Yes. And how important it is here at the marine mm -hmm. park, how the turtles come here and eat special sponge or yes. algae. Tell a little bit about it. Like sure, sure. And, um, this is one of the studies of one of my, um, one of my graduate students. It was the same as that graph there, the genetic stuff. That was Marsha Wright, who's now a medical student. Yeah. And the other is Dustin Ball, who is still working with me on photoid education. Um, that, that work uh, has been done by both of them, actually, uh, and, and all of us. We, we uh, have been observing what the turtles, we've been focused on. We don't know the greens that are here that you see in the reserve. We don't actually know where they feed. Whenever you see them, they're always resting. They don't feed in the reef. They feed on seawater. So we don't know what that is. One of the things we wanted to do this year was to put a satellite, a GPS satellite transmitter on the turtles, both the hawksbills and the greens, to find out where they're moving around. Especially the greens. We want to find out where they're um, but what we found out for hawksbills is they, they feed on um, two main things here in the reserve. One is a sponge called Geodia tunai, uh, which is, I don't know how to, to tell you, but it's a, kind of a, it looks like a, a big rubber sponge. It's not these big barrel sponges, sponges that you see when you're diving, it's not those. That's, that's a, a different kind of sponge. Um, but these ones typically are kind of round and look like they're made of rubber. That's the main sponge that they eat. And they eat this, it's called uh, Geodia Neptune. They also, if you've seen the turtles out there feeding, sometimes they'll get under crevices and be up underneath and they're biting and stuff underneath. What we found out that they were eating is a little red algae called Calamenia. Alamania lemingii is the name of it. 
It's a little tiny red algae like this. It's small and it grows underneath like coral heads and kind of overheads. And the turtles are all constantly looking at this. So what we did was we took samples of that algae, that red algae and the sponge that they eat, and then took samples of other algae that were abundant in the reserve and other sponges that were abundant that they could also eat. And what we found out was that the sponge tends to have more energy than the other sponges that are available. We did this by what's called bomb calorimetry. So we put the sample in a, <clears throat> in a container, we just blow it up, just burn it. And then we get the increase of heat and we can calculate the calories of energy that are coming from that food sample. So we did that with the different sponges, and we did that with the different algae. What we found was this calaminia has way higher energy than anything else that we sample. And so we think that they're eating that because it really gives them a big boost of energy. And that the uh, content, the spicule content, <clears throat> that is these little cal calcium and just uh, little structures within sponges. You know, you, you touch a sponge and it's kind of gritty feeling. That's all these little uh, called, called spicules, they're structures inside the sponge. This particular sponge that they eat has much less um, of these spicules than the other sponge. And so we think that they're really focusing on these. And so what we did was within the whole reserve, we surveyed for that particular sponge that they eat all through, right from West Bay all the way up to Sandy Bay. And we found that West End, West Bay has the most of that sponge. You get up into Sandy Bay, <clears throat> the habitat there seems to have more what's called eutrophication, that is, input of nutrients. We talk about nutrients, we're talking about nitrates and phosphorus. And those are coming from waste material. So they're coming from human waste and communities that have waste and right? They don't have these wastewater treatments. So that stuff is generating an increase in algae. When you dive up this side, you see lots more halomita, this kind of um, algae that's just draped all over the coral. When you come down into the West End and West Bay, you see much, much less of that and more of these, uh, more of these sponges in that tuna. So we did, you can find the papers online, you can look at them, but we found that there were certain areas that were really rich in foods and they corresponded with these small um, home ranges that most of the are spending here in the West End and West Bay, and very few in the other side. So that's why if we're trying to catch turtles, we concentrate kind of down here rather than spending a lot of time. No, we're not going to see them. Um, we have a question from Facebook. Yes. You asked about the sponge that you have on the turtle sanctuary in Calabash. On the turtle sanctuary in Calabash. In Calabash, why? Um, yeah, so uh, we just have been talking with uh, Mr. Perry, who's up there. Um, I don't know exactly the situation, if he has any kind of permits or not. I think he has very good intentions, very good motives. So we are trying to work with him to make him a partner uh, with Protector. Uh, and we've got plans already to go up and tag those turtles so that he can release them. He's wanting to release them, but we'd like to get tags on them because, again, they might end up down here. So we we do not try to encourage lots of people to just go ahead and set up their pens and start taking turtles. But again, they're doing something that uh, Larry Stevenson, the owner of the Reef House, did initially when we first started. That was his only way that he could think of to save the turtles from being sacrificed. Who? Um, at house? No, they weren't keeping them. They were, just they were holding. Them they were holding them, and what he was trying to do was get someone to start reaching. 
So I was actually doing contracts for Lobster and Punk for USA when I met him. And he said, I've only owned a resort for six months and I'm trying to get someone to come down and do something. So at that point, I was not a turtle biologist. I didn't know anything about sea turtles except sea turtles. But uh, I was an inverter. And so I looked into it, found no information about turtles, then started in 2006. And as soon as we got the tag, we started releasing them, and started getting them back from the fishermen with the tags on them, which was good for us because we could do the same thing with start looking at growth. So, um, although I, you know, I, I can't condemn Mr. Perry for doing what he's doing because I think he can get saved. So what we need to do is to partner with him so that he makes sure that he's taking care of them the best he can and that whenever we're here we can get him back. I think one of the complaints we get is that they put them on a pen and then they take pictures and they do like <clears> all these touristic things that people do not agree and maybe the sanctuary is not approved by the government right. or because I know there's a place where they take a, they have a pen that the pottery yes. and they take them some place that are approved by the government. Right. Um, but I do agree, yeah. Before they came to sell the to turtles to my house, yeah. and I said, yeah, uh, I want to take it because I want to save it. Yes. But then you put it back, and then the same turtle went having to buy it again that's several right. times. And that's not, that's not a terrible thing if we can get the information. And the only way to get the information is, again, to tag the turtle. So that every time it comes back, you know this is the same turtle. We can look at growth rate of those turtles in that area. So that's not a terrible thing. As long as the fisherman is not willing to kill them, if he's willing to buy them back and then for a few days do the measurements and release them again, we can get good data. And eventually, again, just like we saw in the life cycle, they're going to leave that area. So they may end up coming here or going to Guanaja. We have no idea. Yeah, that's one of the things we don't want to create that market. We right. don't get it and then we send them. Right. We have the same issues with sharks, rays. Yes. Other species that they come and oh, I want to sell, I want to save them. Right. And you put them on pants and then right. you create that market of exactly. all the so like, Yeah, yeah. And there's, and, and the, yeah, I, I, I can really agree with you. There's got to be some alternative, you know, so that you don't just keep doing this ad infinitum. May do it initially, but then we've got to start talking to the fishermen, start getting some change of mentality there, and working with. For instance, Mr. Perry to get these out. So, like the marine park, normally we get like dead turtles that we put like, vultures and yes. stuff like that. There's anything we can do with them to help in the research because we just we don't know what to do. Yeah, with them. yeah, absolutely. Well, now we're we're actually partnering with the uh, veterinarian clinic here, just by Bulldog. Okay. Yeah, and so um, we have. If there's any place that you can store any turtles, as long as they're not decomposed, but if they're in good shape except for the propeller hits, and they can be put in a freezer, then we can do necropsies. Necropsies on them whenever I come down. We've got one at Anthony's Key right now. I'm hoping to be able to do a necropsy, although I might be able to do it We need to go down and tag those turtles. Yeah, the cow. So, uh, we may not get the chance to do it now, but I'm hoping to get back in September or October uh, to do some public studies and uh, neck prophecies now that we have this relationship with uh, Dr. Bolivar. Yeah. yeah. So um, we will send him materials on the physiology and the anatomy of turtles for him to study out the dam. So I've done a neck prophecy on a large green on the Utila several years ago. Uh, but hopefully we can do more and see if there are issues with plastic, micro, microplastic, digestive tract, diseases. We we just have been taking some blood samples and sending it to Dr. Bolivar this past week. He's got a blood analyzer for dogs, cats, but it has a secret clinic. And the one that they did, we've given them a couple more, we have a um, came up with liver disease. We don't know if that's 
real or not yet because it's just a single sample. It's the first time they've analyzed turtle blood. So we're, we're looking at some parameters and there's been a study in Florida on blood parameters, uh, turtles that are now studying in Europe. But we're again collecting as many samples as we can to analyze to actually look at blood. So there's lots more studies. There's five lifetimes of work for me, which of course I won't be able to do, but um, there's just a lot of work. All right. Any others? Any other questions? Anyone else? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, instead of the previous, we spoke to see if they were down here on the island and they weren't, and they said, thank you. Utila. Utila. Okay. So, are they not asking here because of growth? Is it growth enough as much growth there? So, that's why we can't be. That's, that's what we think. So, so we don't we don't really know because even when I started in two thousand six and seven, that's one of the first things we did on raw turtles, and nobody could tell us yeah turtles nest here every year or every two years. So at that point already there was no regular nesting. So we don't know if they moved to Utila, and that that beach was quite dark. It's a way, it's on the opposite side from Utila town, um, the main town of the island. And there's a fair bit of vegetation there, so it's quite dark. But now all the vegetation is gone. There's beach erosion, which is taking a lot of the vegetation out of the beach. And so now there's lighting. In fact, they, they built a water sports camp center right in almost the middle of that, of that nesting beach. Just back a little bit, there's a few houses, and put big floodlights. So again, once the turtles start seeing those kinds of things, it's going to be a few years, but my hunch is that the nesting is just going to stop there. So that's why we're right now working, we started in 2018, working with Wanaha, the other island, uh, on a uh, nesting recovery project. And that island is the least developed of all the islands because there's no public transport either. You know, hire a plane or you have to hire a boat to get there. They were, they were initially the most tourist island, and Hurricane Mitch hit them directly in 1998, 1998 and wiped the whole island. And from that time, they've never been able to kind of recover the development of the island. Which is a good so what we're working on now is working with local communities there and local organizations. To, we know where there is nesting, we surveying the beaches. And we're actually making an effort to buy one of the nesting beaches uh, and put it in perpetuity as a nesting beach site. And the water in front of it is well. Whether we'll be able to do that, uh, I think with this government we might be able to do that too. And we just submitted a grant a little while ago, which was accepted, but they want to cut the budget in half. We're going to fund it. We'll fund the whole thing. Fund half. We don't. Do it. Let's see what happens. Very good question. Okay. Thank All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.